Come, children, gather around and hear tales about days long ago in the 1980s, before we knew the pressure of too many choices. Movie theaters had three screens, TV had three channels, and there were only two major league soda games in town, Coca-Cola and Pepsi. But just like the Highlander, there could only be one, resulting in a billion-dollar clash of celebrity endorsements, blind taste tests, and the nightmare of new Coke. Today on Weird History Food, we're talking about the 80s carbonated cola wars. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Food channel and let us know in the comments what other classic food wars you'd like to hear about. Okay, Coke or Pepsi? Choose wisely, my friends. The trouble between Coke and Pepsi had been bubbling since their inception. In 1886, a Georgia pharmacist called Dr. John S. Pemberton came up with the idea for blending carbonated water and sweet syrup into a refreshing fountain beverage. A few minor things to note. Pemberton was a morphine addict due to an injury from the Civil War, and Coke was not his first foray into beverages. He'd begun with something called French Wine Cola, which claimed to be a wonderful invigorator of sexual organs. Wow, can't believe that one didn't take off. During a statewide prohibition of alcohol, Pemberton created a non-alcoholic temperance drink, dubbing it Coca-Cola. And while the recipe for Coca-Cola is locked up tighter than your old MySpace account, we can tell you Pemberton's secret ingredients were real Coke, the white powdered kind, and caffeine. Much of soda's earliest innovations were created by pharmacologists adding random substances from their shelves. The Atlanta Journal sounded a coked-up horn when they wrote the soda was delicious, refreshing, exhilarating, invigorating. You tend to speak in exclamation points after downing a can of those secret ingredients. As Coca-Cola's popularity grew, other pharmacists took note. In 1893, a North Carolinian named Dr. Caleb Bradham developed Brad's Drink by combining carbonated water with sugar, caramel, and other natural flavors. That's what I like to hear. Five years later, Brad's drink was rebranded as Pepsi-Cola, either because Brad was and is a pretty lame name, or because they didn't want to get in trouble for stealing his drink. By 1902, the Pepsi-Cola company was up and running, but Coca-Cola was still the dominant cola for the first part of the 20th century. Pepsi had a rough go at it at first, going bankrupt in 1923, though in fairness, pretty much everyone went broke around then. Pepsi restructured in the 1930s, arriving back on the playing field only to see Coke continue to surge ahead in sales. It wasn't that Coke was necessarily better, though it obviously is, especially McDonald's Coke. How? Why? So good. They also knew how to corner the market on a burgeoning Americana, advertising in schools to get kids hooked from an early age and turning Santa Claus into a mascot. Seriously. How do you compete with Santa Claus, a mascot named Brad? No, Brad, that'll never work. By the time World War II broke out, Coca-Cola could be found in 44 countries. In 1965, Pepsi merged with Frito-Lay so it could gain better footholds in the restaurant and supermarket industries. Or maybe they were trying to corner the market as a one-stop shop for munchies. After all, these drinks were being created by the early 20th century equivalent of a guy you have saved in your phone as Molly Mark. But Coca-Cola was busy launching a dizzying array of carbonated beverages like Sprite, Tab, and Fresca, a sugar-free grapefruit soda. How about a Fresca? Oh. Ah. Pepsi just couldn't compete. Sick of playing second fizzle and with very little to lose, Pepsi made its first real crisp move against its colossal cola competitor in the mid-70s with a now-famous challenge. The year, 1975. The place, shopping malls and public areas across America. It was known as the Pepsi Challenge, a genius bit of marketing dreamed up by the soda company's ad team. The premise was simple. Have Americans do a blind taste test between samples of Coke and Pepsi and have them decide which was the superior beverage. Thanks to a higher sugar content, Pepsi was sweeter than Coke, allegedly resulting in over 50% of tasters preferring its taste over the gold standard. Pepsi. Pepsi. Pepsi ads proclaimed victory, praising consumers for knowing a winner when you taste one. Even though it was later determined that the actual preference for one brand over the other was negligible, which still counts as win when you're up against the Goliath-esque Coca-Cola. With Pepsi unexpectedly delivering a solid blow, Coke had to up its game and fast. The brand came back with the biggest celebrity endorsement it could find. 
Someone who Americans liked, someone who they trusted, someone with authority who also appealed to this country's wholesome nature. Coca-Cola went out and got themselves a lovable comedian, Bill Cosby. Yeesh, some things age like a fine wine, others like a Cosby sweater. In the mid-80s marketing campaign, Cosby would go to malls and spy on Pepsi Challenge participants with a pair of binoculars, pointing out flaws in the blind taste test's methodology. Wonder what else he was doing. In retrospect, this was creepy, but it was also effective. Though Pepsi had gained some traction by managing to instill doubt into the minds of thirsty Americans, brand preference was still strong enough to keep Coca-Cola in the lead for now. With the Pepsi Challenge's continued media blitz, Coca-Cola had to find new and creative ways to assert its dominance. That led to Diet Coke in 1982, the first Coca-Cola product to embrace the Coke nickname, not counting its original secret ingredient, of course. Though they'd had limited success in the 60s when Coke first released a low-calorie beverage called Tab, their advertising had mainly marketed it towards women. Tab, you've got to order something first. Just give me something without any sugar in it, okay? Diet Coke, meanwhile, was for the ladies and the fellas. It's a fuller taste, much different than Tab, much stronger. To be clear, Diet Pepsi had existed since 1964, and Royal Crown's Diet Right predated that, making its debut in 1962. But Diet Coke was the first hit in the U.S. diet soda market. In fact, by 1984, it was the nation's third most popular soft drink, right behind Coke and a little uncola known as 7-Up. 7-Up was an anomaly, an outlier in the soda wars that wasn't produced by Pepsi or Coca-Cola, but by Dr. Pepper, whose founder was, you guessed it, a pharmacist. How was Pepsi going to top the one-two punch of Diet Coke and the Cosby endorsement? By getting their own celebrity spokesperson, obviously, and one who had a different market appeal than Cosby's patrician wholesomeness. Pepsi wanted someone cooler, edgier. As MTV came into its own, Pepsi looked for a musician who could literally reach out and touch a younger audience. You see where this is going, right? Michael Jackson, the undisputed king of pop, had already been approached by the Coke team and had passed on a million dollar endorsement deal. Marketing ideas really age well, folks. In a huge upset for the Soda Wars, Jackson teamed up with the underdog Pepsi and became the shining jewel in Pepsi's Choice of a New Generation campaign. It was later revealed that Pepsi had offered Jackson $5 million for shilling the soft drink, the biggest personal endorsement deal in history at the time. Five million. Had all gone as planned, Jackson would have starred in a series of national commercials as well as made it the official beverage of his Victory World Tour. But all did not go as planned. While filming the second of his Pepsi commercials in 1984, a pyrotechnic went off, lighting Jackson's hair up and severely burning his head and face, leaving Moonwalker scarred for the rest of his life. This could have been a sticky situation, but Jackson's camp played nice, probably because of all that money on the table. Not only did Jackson not hold the company at fault, but he would continue on as their spokesperson two years later. Explosions and celebrity scarring aside, Pepsi sales had skyrocketed in the mid-80s, culminating in the 1984 release of Jackson's Soda Spot, featuring the king of pop singing rewritten Pepsi-centric lyrics to his hit song, Billie Jean. Hey, it was a different time. The ad and tour did the trick, attracting a bevy of hip stars like Michael J. Fox, David Bowie, and Madonna to the new generation. Coke's share of the market was in free fall, dropping from 60% during World War II to a mere 20% in the mid-80s. You can actually chart the progress of the Cola Wars by watching Back to the Future movies. In the original Back to the Future, there's whole scenes devoted to Marty McFly ordering various Coca-Cola products. By the release of Back to the Future Part II, shifting consumer preferences and Michael J. Fox's new status as a Pepsi spokesperson resulted in the sequel featuring a whole scene about Pepsi. Advertising campaigns were getting more barbed as well. No longer content to just hype their own product, Pepsi went on the attack. Hi, boys. One commercial featured an archaeologist leading a Pepsi-sipping group of students through the remains of a split-level home and discovering a grime-covered Coca-Cola, effectively calling Coke a relic of the past. 
As the cola wars dragged on, public sentiment was best summed up by journalist and Pepsi head Brian Junger, who said, I'm surprised we didn't just divide the country and put our own sort of pop wall up. Coca-Cola was on the ropes. You know how an animal is always the most dangerous when it's cornered? That adage apparently applies to soda manufacturers as well. Swinging for the fences, Coca-Cola's new CEO, Roberto Goizuega, started a super-secret task force within the company, calling it Project Kansas. Project Kill Machine! That's not what it stands for. So what does it stand for? The code name was an homage to progressive Kansas politician and editor William Allen White, who had once called Coke the sublimated essence of all that America stands for. With the Cosby ads, Coca-Cola had claimed its superiority was due to its more sophisticated flavor, which was less sweet than Pepsi. New focus groups and surveys were being conducted around America, with the goal of retiring Coca-Cola's signature flavor in favor of a sugary upgrade. Sweetened with corn syrup, New Coke was supposed to be a smoother, sweeter flavor closer to Diet Coke. Coca-Cola executives evidently didn't realize people don't drink diet soda because they prefer the taste. While focus groups didn't exactly hate the taste, it wasn't a huge success either. But Coca-Cola made the decision to completely phase out their original product to make way for the new formula. In other words, new Coke would be the only kind of Coke you could buy. Good thing that couldn't possibly go wrong. New Coke debuted in April 1985 to a generally dismal reception. The publisher of Beverages Digest calling the switch the boldest consumer products move of any kind of any stripe since Eve started to hand out apples. That's actually a pretty good slogan, but not for Coca-Cola, which was supposed to be the steady, unflinching hand of the nation's favorite fizzle water. For some reason, the South took this the hardest. Many there were Coca-Cola loyalists and considered Pepsi a Yankee brand. Newsweek likened New Coke to two-day-old Pepsi. A group called the Old Cola Drinkers of America, which really existed and we swear we did not make up, even sued Coca-Cola to revert back to the original branding and formula. And for the very first time in history, Coca-Cola sales sank beneath Pepsi. The horror. The horror. Though the company would rapidly reverse course three months later and put the original flavor back on the shelves under the name Classic Coke, the damage had already been done. Pepsi was now officially winning the Cola Wars. When New Coke debuted, Pepsi took out ads featuring a betrayed consumer whimpering, why did Coke change? The answer the ad was hinting at was obvious. Pepsi had gotten under Coke's delicious caramely skin with the Pepsi Challenge taste test. By tinkering with their tried and true formula, Coke was essentially admitting there was something wrong with it. It was an identity crisis. Following Coca-Cola's announcement of their commitment to new Coke, Pepsi took out a full-page ad in the New York Times declaring victory. Employees were allowed to go home early, with Pepsi's CEO Roger Enrico claiming, by today's action, Coke has admitted that it's not the real thing. In other words, Pepsi was absolutely reveling in being a messy bitch. Three months later, Coca-Cola reversed course with a half measure, reintroducing the original flavor under the brand Classic Coke. This just made the problem worse. Much like having two actresses nominated in the same category for the same movie, New Coke and Classic Coke both on the shelves confused customers and split the vote, reducing sales for both flavors. Desperate, Coca-Cola ditched Cosby, which was honestly best for everyone then and the future, and hired fictional pop culture character M -M Max Headroom as the face of New Coke. However, the selection of Max Headroom was seen by some as a forced attempt to court the same youthful demographic as Pepsi's New Generation campaign. Sort of a precursor to the how do you do, fellow kids meme featuring Steve Buscemi. Come to think of it, Steve Buscemi would make an excellent soda spokesman. But this was far from the end of Coca-Cola, as you may have noticed by the brand's continued presence in just about every corner store and restaurant in America. After an initial surge in sales following New Coke's release, Pepsi failed to gain many converts. People didn't hate New Coke. In fact, some weirdos actually liked it. It's the best Coke I've ever had. It's just delicious. The animosity was more directed at the total removal of the original formula. Sort of like how George Lucas deleted the original versions of the Star Wars trilogy after those god-awful special editions came out. And at the end of the year, it was Coca-Cola who claimed the most in sales, with Classic Coke outselling both New Coke and Pepsi. Just goes to show, 
you can't teach an old soda new tricks. Well, you can, just don't expect to sell it in the South. So what do you think? Which cola rules them all? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Weird History Food.